I'm just going to start praying right now, take a few minutes and just acknowledge and honor this God that we serve once again in a continuation of worship. And so, like, I appreciate you and those of you who are willing to pray for me as, as I uh, pray and as I speak this morning. Oh, just know that I am grateful to you. Your prayers are appreciated. Will you pray with me this morning? God of glory, <laughs> Lord of light, we just humble ourselves once again before you. We just honor and acknowledge you in this place this morning. God, it's so good to worship you. It's so, so good to be gathered with brothers and sisters around the throne crying out like the angels, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Oh, you're holy, and we thank you this morning. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and to be before you. I thank you, Lord, for your spirit which is in this place. Your spirit which just invaded our time of worship. Your spirit which is in the faces and the hearts of your people. Thank you, God. Thank you that your presence is before us this morning. And so, Lord, with that, I gladly decrease now that you might increase in this place. Lord, I, I'm gladly hidden behind the cross of Jesus Christ right now that I would not be seen, but that you would be seen by all in this place. Descend upon us, Spirit of the living Lord. You are welcome to descend right now and move from mind to mind and heart to heart as we look into your word. Oh God, we are grateful. So we welcome your presence. <laughs> we, we need your presence. <laughs> we look forward to your presence, oh God, and speak to us what you will in this hour for your servants are now listening. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise right now in the mighty, in the strong and matchless name of Jesus, who is our risen Savior. <laughs> amen. 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 Love to pray. <laughs> just, just pray through the day. That's my motto. You know, I used to say amen more and more. It's just a continuous dialogue, and I find I, I rarely say amen anymore. Well, as Ike said, I, I come to you from the Sanctuary Covenant Church, also from, from Bethel Seminary, where I'm, I'm uh, wrapping up a seminary career uh, even now, and um, it has just been a glorious, glorious journey. And, and you know, as I was preparing, even weeks ago, to come to Woodland Hills Church and speak, you know, I thought and, and pondered with the Lord. I said, well, Lord, you know, I'm passionate about this prayer thing. I, I, I love to pray. I, I'm very excited about prayer. I've I'm a student of prayer. I've studied a few things, so surely I must have something to say about prayer. And so what I did as a result of that is just prepared an elaborate message on the purpose, the place, and the power of prayer for you this morning. And surely I thought that that is what I would speak. But the Lord <laughs> knocked on my little door earlier this week. <laughs> he wrestled me down on what I had a mind to do. And he said, Cecilia, wouldn't you rather just give the word that I have for my people at Woodland Hills. Wouldn't you just prefer to tell them what I want them to know, what, what, what my heart is for them? And so how many know the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice? <laughs> and so this morning, if you'll allow me, I'm just going to be obedient to what I believe is an amazing word of God. And I just have to tell you, it resonates with me. It speaks to me. So I'm not going to speak it to you this morning. I'm going to let the, the Spirit of God speak it to all of us. But I'll start by telling you that I had a, a birthday, another one, just last month. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, birthdays anymore, just, boy, they, they spark these periods of deep, deep, reflection. They're funny that way birthdays are. I mean, I think they can cause us to look back and just to begin to analyze our lives, maybe ponder, kind of wonder even what might have been. And they can also cause us to look forward, I think, and ponder the days to come. And for many of us, that is just a tremendously hope-filled enterprise. But there are others of us, I think, for whom that is sort of scary. That, that's an uncertain prospect at best. It can, it can be a bleak thing. 
Well, I'll tell you what. I brought along a little clip this morning, just a little movie clip that I, that I would like to show you because I think that this clip really, really illustrates the difficulty that I think many of it of us experience navigating this thing um, called life. And with the help of your wonderful technology team, we're gonna show it to you. Now let me set this up for you. Um, in this particular movie, Jack Nicholson plays a man who has been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. He, um, his, his life is in a neat little box, very rhythmic, very rhythmic. He, he has everything just so. But then what happens is he begins to experience attachment. He begins to fall in love, and man, he just does not know what to do with those emotions. So in this particular scene that we're about to show you, he rips off to his psychiatrist's office and he barges in unannounced. Take a look. I mean, did you hear the man go, oh? And did you see the expressions on, on the patient's faces? It was like it, was like it just all of a sudden sort of dawned on them wow, here we are again in this psychiatrist's lobby waiting for the help that we, we desperately need with our struggles. And yeah, what if this is as good as it gets? What if this is it? What if it never gets any better than this present struggle? What if my best is behind me, and what if that best wasn't really all that great? Boy, I am just persuaded as I stand before you this morning that if we read or watch the news at all, if our eyes are opened, our ears are attentive to what's really going on in this world. I mean, if we were even just to embrace some of the really hard circumstances of our own daily existence, why then, in a very real, very natural sense, we could become discouraged. I mean, globally, <laughs> the global situation is ominous at best. And locally, well, depending upon what locally means to you, okay, that's another sermon, but, but locally, things aren't much better. For example, I live, work, and worship in North Minneapolis. You've probably read about us this summer. Um, I, I live in a place where, despite aggressive prayer and evangelistic efforts in collaboration with a number of partnering churches, despite very positive, proactive, and reactive community intervention this summer, this year, statistics report that violent crime rose dramatically. In this summer, the homicide rate alone doubled. Now, that's not very hope-filled news. Oh, and personally, personally, we struggle. I mean, I think if we would just be honest with ourselves, if we would just admit that even though we are in Christ, we struggle, we just do, we can see that, yeah, sometimes things occasionally do appear to be sort of hopeless. Oh, but the good news today, <laughs> Woodland Hills Church, the good news is that our God has something to say about all of these matters. He wants to weigh in on this. He wants to be intimately connected with all of the things that are affecting his children. And so while we may be tempted to despair, I would say, before we hang our hat on the report of the world, we ought to hear the word of the Lord. Does anybody in this house resonate with that? Is that a sentiment that you share? I think we ought to hear the word of the Lord. So, you know, there's this amazing little passage. It's just an obscure little Old Testament passage in an Old Testament prophetic book, but it's so profound. The Lord brought it to my attention and I was blown away. I believe that it speaks powerfully, maybe even prophetically, even to the 21st century church. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to ask you to grab them now. And if you want to turn to the Old Testament book of Haggai. <laughs> Now, hey guys, at, at the very end of the Old Testament, just about three books before the New Testament, for those of you who are looking, I'll let you just kind of flip there really quickly. And for those of you who don't have your Bible, we'll project this scripture on the screen. Haggai. And we're going to read from chapter 2, starting in verse 3. 
And this is just an amazing word. Let, let it go deep in you today. This is what the word of the Lord says. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua. Take courage, all you people of the land. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise I made you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides with you, fear not. For thus, in a little while, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, I love this. Listen now, listen now. Once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. Now listen to this, church, this is revelatory, catch this. The Lord, this is God speaking through his prophet. This is what he says. Now, the silver is mine <laughs> and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. But watch this, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. What a brilliant passage of scripture. Oh God, thank you for your amazing word. Oh, I'm just so moved by that. I hope that you are also. Now, here's the situation. Let's just put a little meat around this passage, just, just very briefly, very quickly. It has been 50 years since the city of Jerusalem had been sacked. Solomon's temple, which was the house of God, just envision now Woodland Hills, Solomon's temple, which was the house of God, had been destroyed, and the people of God had been carried into exile. Oh, but there was a remnant. Can someone say remnant? Oh, there was a remnant, a remnant people of God who had made their way back to the city where God Most High had placed his name. And in this particular passage, God is instructing them through the prophet Haggai to rebuild the temple which lay in ruins. In fact, if you were to read this text closely, you would pick up on the fact that God is a little indignant with the remnant. Why? because they've been dragging their feet. Now, there are a number of reasons for this, but perhaps the most discouraging for this people, perhaps the most, the most understandable, is the fact that some of them had seen the former temple. They had seen the majesty. They had seen the riches. They had seen, they had actually lived long enough to remember the glory of Solomon's temple. Oh. It was like a 10th century B.C. megachurch. It was a big deal. Oh, it had a renowned priesthood. Charismatic rabbis, they had books for sale, radio shows. They were on the TBN, that is the Temple Broadcasting Network, every week with their sermons. It was a big deal. They had tens of thousands of people in their church membership, and yet they had community. Best of all, they had the favor of God. That temple and that temple atmosphere was glorious. And man, I just think some of these people were like, hey, how are we ever going to get back to that? Oh, those glory days are gone for sure. And so while this people had maybe the physical wherewithal to rebuild mentally, I think, they were discouraged from doing so. But I want to draw your attention to something equally important because what we don't see in this passage but would read in chapter 1 of this book is the fact that these people really, man, they really had no excuse for avoiding temple work because God had allowed them already to build and to restore their own houses. Now, I just want to sit in this point for one second. I just want to sit here for a second because I think this is very important. Sometimes I think the opposite can also be true. And I saw the opposite in this passage. What do I mean by that? Sometimes I think we have this tendency of just setting about the task of trying to rebuild, trying to build the house of God while our own house lies in disrepair. 
Sometimes, I mean, occasionally, I think the truth of the matter is we get really busy in the house of the Lord or elsewhere. We get really busy on our jobs, out in the marketplace, in the schoolhouse even, just so we can avoid analyzing what's going on in our own house. So I have a question for you this morning, Woodland Hills Church. What state is your house in? What is the state of your house. Oh, because I want to tell you something this morning. God is not just concerned with his house. He's concerned with yours also. (laughs) And he's concerned with mine. God is not just concerned with the temple. He's concerned with your temple, with your house. I just think, I'm convinced this morning that if we're going to really be and do the connectional the transformational ministry that Jesus Christ himself called us to do, called us to be. If we're going to be about that, if, if we're going to really get into an authentic dance with one another, maybe even before we can truly be the hands, the feet, the face of Jesus Christ in this world, we're going to have to tend to our own homes. We're going to have to tend to our own houses I think that Jesus is speaking something really strongly to us in this. After all, why are we here? I mean, I think after worshiping him, it is to be the hands and the feet and the face of Jesus Christ in this world. And I think that the, that the Lord might be telling us, listen, listen, children, I want you to do some work on your own house so that you're adequately prepared to worship me. You're adequately prepared to be my hands and feet. Let's hear what the Lord is speaking this morning. He's calling us to build our houses. He's calling us to build the house of the Lord. So how, Cecilia, are we going to do that? Well, I am just a proponent. As I mentioned, I just, I'm passionate for the word of God. And I'm just a proponent of mining the word of God. I believe that there are nuggets of gold in there. And I believe if we dig deeply, we could hear what God is trying to say. And we don't have to look past the passage that we read this morning. It is filled with possibilities that the Lord may want us to consider. But this morning, very quickly, I'm going to focus on just three, which I think have special significance to the house of God. The first of which is mentioned four times in this passage alone. Now listen, listen, Bible reader, anytime God mentions something four times in a passage as small as ours, that's a, that's a cue. That's like believers sit up and take notice. Four times God mentions this first point, fear not. Fear not. Be courageous. Be strong. Take courage, all you people of the land. Fear not. Four times God speaks it through the prophet. Why? Because God knows fear is real for us. He knows fear is real. Listen, the people in our passage, they weren't just a lazy people. They weren't just trying to get out of work. They had some legitimate fear. Do any of us have fear this morning? These people were legitimately fearful. You see, the land they returned to wasn't the land that they left. Some inhabitants had settled in the land. Man, they had internal and external opposition. And need I remind you that this people had just come out of captivity? Man, fear of the past. Fear of the past propensity to repeat itself. Man, that was ever before this people. They were afraid. Fear, church, is real. I don't care what our little Christianese says. I don't care about the little pat answers that we give one another. Oh, just use faith. Faith is the opposite of fear. Fear is real. Fear is real in our lives. Maybe you've gone through a thing or two in your life. Maybe you've been rejected, and you know what the pain of rejection feels like, so now you have a fear of rejection. That's real. Maybe you have a fear of failure for a lot of years that paralyzed me. A fear of not succeeding. A fear of failure that's real. I'm just telling you, God understands that we're going to deal with this. In the face, I think, of what God is calling some of us to, if you'll let me say this while your pastor's not here, in the face of what he's calling Woodland Hills to, in the face of what he might be calling some of you, to come out of. 
there is a natural inclination that we might have to become a little fearful. <laughs> and I want to just make a really a strong uh, statement today. <laughs> And I don't know if you'll agree with this or not. It's okay if you don't. But I would contend this morning that we cannot will ourselves out of fear. How often do we try, though? We can't will ourselves into faith. We can't will ourselves into obedience. We can't will ourselves into, into repentance. We cannot will ourselves into things that we spend an awful lot of energy trying to will ourselves into. Oh, I just think the Apostle Paul got this. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the passage in Romans chapter 7, but listen, what the apost- listen to what the Apostle says. Now, this was a mighty man of God. He was doing God's work, business. Doing, he was in service to God. He, from all practical appearance, should have had this together. And this is what Paul says. He says, listen, for the very thing <laughs> I want to do, Those things I know that are right, like to walk in faith and to trust God's word and to trust in his promises, those things which are good, which are godly, those are the things I never do. Oh, but the very things I hate, like my little problem with fear, the very things I know I ought never do, those are the things I do consistently. And if you would read Paul in Romans 7, you just get a picture of a man who's like wanting to pull out his hair. He's so frustrated. He even says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who is going to save me from this life of sin and death? He's he's an existential angst. (laughs) But then... In Romans 7, it's like, a, it's like a little light bulb comes on in the back of his head. Like, doing this little light bulb comes on. And he says, oh, thanks be to God. He will do it through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. He's the one who's going to do it. Which is precisely why the passage we read this morning precedes the words, fear not with these words, my spirit abides with you. My spirit abides with you, fear not. My spirit of power abides with you. My spirit of wisdom abides with you. My spirit of revelation knowledge abides with you. That is why I can tell you not to be afraid. Oh, I just, I just think it's, it's going to take extraordinary intervention and supernatural power from on high in order for us to battle through issues like OCD and depression. It's going to take some power that we cannot manufacture in order for us to get out of unhealthy friendships, relationships, or, or alliances. <laughs> This is radical now. Don't shoot the messenger. It's going to take some power from on high for us to shed that evil spirit of self-sufficiency and come all the way into this place of utter dependency upon this God we serve. It's going to take some power. It's going to take power for us to overcome fear itself. Power, frankly, children of God, that on our own we do not have. And I think just being able to admit that we don't have it is half the battle. I mean, as soon as we catch a revelation that we cannot do this thing on our own, then we're in a position to build. We've got to get there, though. My spirit abides with you. Fear not. But then this passage says something else really, really important. (laughs) Something kind of controversial, I'd I'd wait. It says, work. (laughs) Do the work. Do the work, for I am with you. I want to make a couple of points about this, because I think sometimes we Christians kind of mix this up a little bit. Not, Not heaping condemnation. I get this twisted all the time. God says, work, for I am with you, work. Now, let's be clear. Because I think the Bible is clear. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 8, it says these words, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not because of works, lest any man, any woman, should have a temptation 
to boast. There is no amount of work that you can do which would cause our God to love you any more than he does right now. Will you hear that this morning? There is nothing you can do that would cause him to love you any more than he does right now. And by the way, some of you need to hear this. There's nothing that you can do that would cause him to love you any less. He loves you immensely right now, and his salvation is a free gift. All you can do is receive it. And yet, Through the New Testament, all across it, we find this concept of work. And I'm afraid in our 21st century church, we've kind of come to think of work as a a bit of a dirty word. I'm here to tell you work is a holy word. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Even Messiah, even Jesus said, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. Because soon the nighttime comes when no man, no woman is going to work. Work. Our text says there is a work for us to do. So the question is, what is this work that is required of us? Well, you know, a crowd came upon Jesus in a place called Capernaum, and they had that very question in mind. They said to him, Rabbi, what must we be doing to do the works of God? And this is what Jesus said to them. The work of God, the work of God is to believe upon him who sent me. That is the work. That seems awfully simple. The work of God is that you believe in him whom God sent. That's the work that we must do. I have a question for you, Woodland Hills. Do we really, now I mean really, with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, do we really believe that he is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do? Do we really believe in his power? Do we really believe with everything that we are and everything that we have that he is in us and to us everything he says he is? I just think that's really important this morning because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Are we willing to work the works of obedience this morning? The Bible says, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Are we willing to work the works of repentance this morning? Are we willing to work the works of intimacy. Oh, the pastor at my church, Pastor Ephraim Smith, you know him. He's been uh, in a pulpit uh, share with Pastor Dave Johnson from Church of the Open Door. You probably know him too. And this summer, they've, they've actually gone side by side into a couple of pulpits. And, and they bring this brilliant imagery, this picture of a dance. And they talk about dancing with one another. They talk about an authentic dance, which, man, is a supernatural thing because it can pair a a, a white suburban uh, pastor alongside an African-American urban pastor and bring them together side by side in pulpits around this city to deliver a message. I think that's amazing. But this this image of the dance, this intimacy, and I I would just contend that before we can get into that kind of an intimate dance with one another, which we we run ahead and try to do, we've got to be in an intimate dance with the master. We've got to learn how to dance with him. We've got to be in a place of intimacy with Jesus. Are we willing to work the works of intimacy? Dr. David Clark, oh, my favorite systematic theology professor, was here just a couple of weeks ago, and he said this thing. He said, leadership, I mean great leadership, flows sacrificially from a full heart. Do you know what I think? And this is just bold of me, I know, forgive me. I think your pastor is working the works of intimacy with God this summer. I think he's been out working the works of intimacy. Oh, and you know, I don't know about you, but I want to be aligned with a man who steals away. (laughs) I want to be aligned with a pastor who's willing to hide away. (laughs) I I don't know about you, but I want to hear from someone who toils and wrestles with God, who is not content with a quick 
fixed, but who will wrestle like Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night long until he blessed him. That's who I want to hear from. That's the man of God that I believe has a transformational word from my heart. I think your pastor is out working the works of intimacy. And I'm grateful to be this morning here, the transition woman who brings him back to the pulpit because you know what? I think that man is going to come back so full. Someone said a few weeks ago, you might need seatbelts on those seats. He's going to come back with an outpouring of God and he's going to move this house to the next level. Oh, that's good news. He's working the works of intimacy. It's a little warm up here. I'm just going to take that. <laughs> and part of the reason why I need to take that off is because I'm looking at the clock and I have time to tell you a quick story. I'm going to tell you a story about the dance that may drive this point home. Listen, as, I, as, as God revealed this message to me and he started really working with me on this imagery of the dance, he brought back to my memory my junior prom. Now I'm just going to tell you a quick story about my junior prom. You see, I went to my junior prom with a young man named Willie. Now Willie was a school chum of mine. I had never dated. I had never, I had maybe been to a couple of junior high school dances, but I had, had barely been out at all, let alone with a boy. And Willie came to me one day. He was a, a, a junior. I was a sophomore. We sat next to each other in a class. He wanted to go to the prom. I wanted to go to the prom. He said, would you like to go to the prom? I said, I'd love to go to the prom. So we got together and we went to the prom. Now, I need to tell you something. My mother, who is probably, maybe, I don't know, some of you might want to compete with her. She, she might be the most overprotective woman in the whole world. She was not going to let me go to this prom. She said, oh, you're far too young. You know, there's no, no, there's no way that you're, you're going to do that. But, but she knew Willie's parents. And when she found out they were going to be chaperoning and they were going to in fact pick me up and drive us to the prom and then drive us home afterwards somehow she relented and she let me go so Willie and I get together and we go to the prom mind you I've never dated I've certainly never dated this man I I have never been out in this kind of environment I don't know what to expect but Willie and I get together and we go to the prom so we get to the prom you know, and we do our little hors d'oeuvre thing, and they have the announcements, blah, blah, blah. And then they, you know, they, they crown the king and the queen. They do the, that whole thing, la di da di da 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 But then pretty soon, we know, because there's nothing else left on the agenda, it's time to dance. It's time to dance. And that's basically what I had gone for. And so all of a sudden, this, this, this flurry of activity begins to happen. Oh, the house lights go down and the dance floor lights come up. And people begin to move the tables and the chairs back and clear out this place for the dance. And, and pretty soon, Willie looks at me and he says, would you like to dance? And I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm ready to dance. I mean, there wasn't anything in that except for I just wanted to have a good time. And I thought that's what the prom is all about. I'm going to dance my socks off tonight. We're going to dance. So we get out to the dance floor, and at first, it's a pretty cool thing, right? You know, it's just kind of, we're just kind of bopping along, and I'm looking at Willie, he's looking at me, and I'm like, this is sweet, this is so cool, I'm like a grown-up, I'm at a big grown-up dance, and I'm dancing with a boy, this is something. <laughs> and, and, and then, but all of a sudden, the music got really lively, and that beat just came up. And it just started kind of rocking the house. And, and you know, let me just preface what I'm going to tell you with two things. First of all, uh, contrary to popular belief, all black people don't have rhythm. And, and second of all, what I want to tell you is that it's really not how Willie danced. It's, it's more about where Willie danced. Because that music came up, that beat just kind of got a hold of him. And all of a sudden, he was like, Oh my gosh, I was like, oh Lord, oh, I mean, you know, listen church, Willie went from the east wall to the west wall. He went from the front of the stage to the back of the hall. He, oh, that man was cutting, or, he was just. <laughs> he was all over that auditorium. I mean, I spent a healthy, I just played a healthy game of where's Willie all night long. <laughs> Willie, I'm looking for him every once in a while. He danced past me. It was the craziest thing. Oh, that Willie. God bless that Willie. Oh. So we're in the car on the way home. <laughs> and something 
really profound occurred to me about that dance. And I think it's the reason why I tell this story. Because it occurred to me that Willie hadn't danced with me as much as he had danced around me. And I wonder if that doesn't characterize some of our relationships with the Lord. I mean, I think we're friends. Oh, Jesus is my best friend. We hang out. We bump elbows with each other. We might pass each other now and again. But are you really in the dance of life with Jesus as your partner? Is he really your partner in this dance of life? Are you really willing to work the works of intimacy with the master? That is a work I believe is set before us, a work that he demands. Listen, the people of our scripture had some literal work. They did. Brick upon brick, brick mortar, brick mortar, brick mortar. They had some literal physical work that was required of them to do. And can I tell you one, interest, one other interesting point before I come to my close? These people came back and they were broke. They did not have resources. And in the face of that, God is saying, build a temple for my presence. This is why God says, listen, church, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. I know how to shake all nations and bring the treasures you need in. But here's a purpose clause, church. Here's a purpose clause that has a lot to do with our twisted view of prosperity these days. I know how to bring it in, and I will bring it in, says God most high. Why? So you can be healthy, wealthy, and wise? No. So you can build the temple. So you can extend the works of God's kingdom. So that you can take that resource and build the temple and extend its works. That's brilliant to me, because God's word is always just brilliantly able to put us back in check when we get a little out of, out of alignment with it. Well, here's the last point. Simple point, claim the promise. This text says, claim the promise. God says, I am with you according to the promise I made you when you came out of bondage. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. What was that promise? I will be your God and you will be my people. And God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Hear this, someone. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 says this, For no matter how many are the promises that God has made, they all, every one of them, find their yes in Christ Jesus. And so we speak amen to the glory of God. He says yes, we say amen. He says yes, we say amen. Claim the promises. In order to claim them, you, you've got to know them. It's a plug for Bible study. Discipleship pastor, you can thank me afterward. A plug for Bible. You have got to know the promises of God before you can claim them. Guess what else you have to do? You have got to trust the promises of God. Know them, trust them, claim them. It has everything to do. Here's the truth of the matter, and then I'm going to close. Here's just the truth of the matter. I just want to give it to you straight because we could think that something really magnificent happened, but here's what happened from our passage. The temple that this people rebuilt, it was far less grand than the previous temple. To the natural eye, I mean, it, it just, it paled in comparison to Solomon's temple. It was smaller. It only had a fraction of the wealth. But do you know why God would prophesy that its glory would exceed the former glory? Because it was the temple that Jesus Christ himself would enter. It's the temple that our Lord would enter. And he would sit down in that temple and he would open the scroll in that temple and he would teach people the words of life in that place. Hear me, Woodland Hills. It wasn't because that temple was at its greatest state. It wasn't that the temple was in its best condition. It wasn't that the temple was at its best. It's because the temple's best was yet to come. Oh man, oh woman, I just, I wonder if you're here this morning and you think your high points have been had. 
I wonder if you're here and you think your best of times is behind you. Maybe, maybe you're here and you would just say, hey, my glory days are, are in the past. I, I think this is about as good as it can get. Um, I think I've seen my best. I don't know why God sent me this morning except for apparently to tell you, honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Your best is yet to come. I don't care if, oh, you know, I don't care if you're retired in this house and you've hung up your career sneakers and you think that God has done just about as much with you as he can possibly do. Your best is yet to come. I wonder if you're a young person across this house and you know what, you've just, it's been, you've been battling this cynicism, this skepticism because you see with fresh eyes just how really messed up this world in, is in young person, the best is not this. <laughs> the best is yet to come and I want to tell you it's because the king is soon to come. The best is yet to come because the king is soon to come, but lest, and this, I'll just leave you with this and be done, lest you believe that you have to wait for glory, to receive deliverance, to receive salvation, to receive a, a restoration. Let me just tell you one thing. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. I mean life today. Abundant life, deep abiding life, full life, the kind of life that I have come for you to have on this side of glory. You don't have to wait until the next side of glory. So if my friend will come forward, I'm just going to ask her just to, pray, to play a little uh, soft music uh, today as we close out this service, if she's here. And, and we're just, you know what, I'm just going to begin to pray. And I'll ask you to just bow your heads with me, if you will. And, and let's, just, let's just begin to pray, because, you know, I sense that that God is, is doing something in this place. I mean, I, I sense that someone's weary today and just thinking, man, I, I, you know, I just, you know, I don't know if I have all that much left. I, I'm weary, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm a little frustrated, maybe I'm depressed in this place today. And I just don't know. I don't know, you know, I just don't know how I'm gonna keep going on. I just wanna pray for someone across this place today. Who, who takes this message and, and, with, and cognitively with your head, you can hear the hope of it, but in your heart, it's just kind of stuck. You're like, man, I've just, I've been through so many things. I just don't know, you know, if, if I can grab hold of that. I don't know if I can trust the promises of God. I don't, I don't know if this faith is ever going to come to me. I don't know. Maybe you're here today and you're like, yeah, this is it. This is as good as it gets it can't get better than this and you know so you don't know what I struggle with it's an ailment that you can't understand I want to pray for you this morning whoever you are across this place you know we end the service there are going to be some prayer people here to pray uh, but I want to pray for you right now because you know sometimes we think we have to come forward to the altar in order for Jesus to meet us I want to tell you Jesus Christ is here and he you don't have to come to him he'll come to you this morning right in the midst of where you sit Let's begin to pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your holy word. We thank you so much for your holy word. We thank you for your spirit, which is convicting, it's penetrating, it's piercing all across this auditorium even now. We thank you for a spirit of hope because that hope is gonna move us beyond this helplessness we feel. We thank you, oh God, that there is hope in you through Jesus Christ. We thank you. It's not because of our works. <laughs> Lord, this busyness we've spent, this, this perfection we've tried to attain to, oh God, it isn't working for us. We lay it before you right now. We lay it at the foot of your cross. And we say we need you to come on the inside and to work through us, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. We need you today, Jesus. We need you. We need you, and because we know your name is called faithful and true, we cry out to you right now. Father, all across this house, I just pray that through the, the spirit, the presence, and the power of Jesus Christ and, and his spirit, that you would minister to some heart, Father God, and that you would bring hope to helplessness, that you would bring a release from fear, oh God, that you would bring a sense of worthiness that can only come from you, a sense of self-assurance, oh God. Not self-assurance, but assurance in you, oh God. 
Father, I pray that you would bring these things right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, because I'm bold and just foolish enough to think that you might want to heal somebody in this place, Father, your spirit of healing, I pray you would minister all across this place. Your word says you specialize in binding up the brokenhearted. Father, minister right now in the mighty name of Jesus and through the power of his spirit. We thank you for what you've done here. We thank you for what you've said. Father, I pray this word would go deep and take root. And Father, I pray, thanking you in advance, that it will bear fruit in due season. You are a glorious God. You are worthy, so worthy of our praise today. And we say thank you. We say thank you. In the strong name of Jesus, oh, we say thank you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.